choice since the beginning of time. From the time that Satan swiveled up to Eden, we've had a choice. And no greater feeling should you have than to decide 
to follow Jesus. I was, uh, I was pleased to hear uh, Dr. Crawford choose that song. Because if you were, you, you read the responsive reading, and the responsive reading dealt specifically with that subject about following Jesus. So we are going to receive the message now. And it comes from Acts chapter 16. And I am going to read one verse. And then I'll bring the message. It's verse number 35. And when it was day, the magistrates sent the sergeants, saying, Let those men go. And I'd like to talk to you this morning about daylight is coming. Amen? Daylight is coming. Now, if you came to hear me sing a song this morning, uh, you you're probably going to get that. If you, if you came here this morning to hear me break out in a, in a good, rich prayer, and, and you probably won't get that either. But if you came to hear the Word of God, amen? The Word of God, and then you're going to get that. And this Word of God concerns daylight is coming. You know, there are a lot of recorded miracles in the Bible. The Bible, the, the, the countless of miracles, not only performed by God, but by, by His chosen. Uh, we read uh, uh, where Moses, he raised the staff and parted the Red Sea. Amen? Amen. We read where Paul uh, laid on a child, and when he got up, the child was alive. We've, we've heard about all of these miracles that were recorded, but this particular miracle, and I just discovered this recently. Y'all heard me say before that when I came to this church, there was a lot of things that I did not know about this Bible. And through the teachings and the preachings over the last two years, I have been, uh, uh, a, a lot of things have been illuminated to me. And this was one particular thing that uh, when I was going through this message, it dawned on me. It dawned on me. Verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas, uh, excuse me, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. At midnight. This, and I, you know what I do? I had to go back through the Bible and look at all the miracles. This was the first miracle that I found that had an exact time. Didn't tell you what time Moses parted the Red Sea. You just assumed that it was in the daytime. Amen? Didn't tell you what time that Paul laid on that boy and, 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 and boom, he was alive. But you knew it was laid up in the evening. When uh, the disciples came to the gate, a man was healed. When Jesus healed the man at the pool of Bethesda, that was a miracle. But it didn't say what time it was. You just assumed that it was probably during the day. But this scripture says, and at midnight. So God had to inspire the writer to point out to us that it was midnight. And I believe I know the reason God wanted us to know that this miracle happened at midnight. He wants you to know, and like I want you to know, that what happens at midnight? What happens at midnight? A new day. Amen? A new day. Everything up to 11.59 and 59 seconds is yesterday. When it strikes, when the clock strikes 12 midnight, it is a new day. And here were Paul and Silas in prison. 
And what were they doing at midnight? Singing hymns and praying. Giving praises to God at midnight. Because I believe that the reason that they were praising God and singing hymns is because they knew that because of God, daylight was coming. Amen? Now, what does the scripture say happened at midnight? It says that suddenly there was a great earthquake so that there the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loose. So that was the miracle. Now, y'all know me, I'm not going to give you a half a loaf. There are some naysayers, and I've actually heard them say, oh, that wasn't a miracle, that was an act of God. Oh, earthquakes happen all the time. And, 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 and I give them that point, earthquakes happen all the time. But then I asked them to explain to me, because you just said earthquakes happen, those doors could have flew open because of the earthquake. Shaking the foundations of the prison. But now, I don't believe there's an earthquake ever that has shook this earth so hard that the shackles came loose off of the hands and the feet. Amen? Isn't that what the scripture says happened? And their bands were loose. In other words, that earthquake was so devastating that it shook the shackles off of their hands and feet. Because God doesn't lie. And his word doesn't lie. And the word says, and their bands were loose. Now how, tell me, how could an earthquake, uh, 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 just a simple earthquake, do all of that? But nowhere do you read that the prison was destroyed. Amen. The ground shook. The foundation shook. And the bands were loose from their hands. Amen. But you see, Paul and Silas, there they were at midnight. And they were singing hymns, giving praises to God and praying. In other words, they were engulfed in their praises and honor of God. And then God delivered them. The scriptures say the jailer thought that they had escaped, but they were still there. Because I, when the jailer woke up, and I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure that when he woke up and he went out and saw all the doors open, he just knew that the prisoners were gone. Yeah. And back in those days, if you were responsible for prisoners and those prisoners escaped, they took your life. You see, the scripture said that he took his sword out. He was ready to kill himself because he knew that if he had killed himself, that they were going to kill him. Because he had let them escape. But then the word says that Paul yelled out in a very loud voice and said, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. See, not only did Paul and Silas get a daylight, amen, but this jailer, his daylight came his way. Because his life was spared simply because they did not escape. Amen? And then what happened? He came to them and he fell before Paul and Silas and brought them out and asked the question, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Amen? Believe on Jesus and thou shalt be saved. And that, my brothers and sisters, is your daylight. Your daylight is coming. You can't do anything about what happened. 
yesterday. Could, could Paul and Silas have done anything about them being arrested and thrown in prison? No, because that had happened already. And this is what I am trying to convey to you, that your daylight is coming, that when it reaches midnight, it is a new day. So whatever was going on yesterday, give no thought to it. Because today is a new day. That's why I say good morning. I, I don't care who it is. I say good morning, good morning, good morning. Because it is indeed a good morning. And I'm smart enough to know that there are some people who were not blessed in the manner that I was blessed. Amen? Amen. Some people did not wake up this morning. They had all kinds of plans. But then midnight came and it was a new day. And they were not part of this new day. God saw fit and they weren't part of this new day. They did not wake up this morning. God called them to glory this morning. But for the rest of us, for those who were blessed to have our eyes open, our daylight came. You have to look towards the new day. Because like I said, there is nothing that you can do about what happened yesterday. What are you talking about, Reverend? Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. You have a friend over to your house, and you let them in, and they come on in, and, and y'all sitting there talking, and then uh, and your friend decides to leave, and then after you let your friend out, you come back, and you notice that there's a $5 bill that's missing from your coffee table. You knew it was there when you let them in, and now it's gone. And you and your friend were the only two people in the house. So what are you thinking? My friend must have stole my five dollars. The next day, there's a knock on your door. And it's your friend. And they say, can I come in? And you, a little hesitant. <laughs> hey, it's human nature for us to be hesitant. <laughs> you a little hesitant, but you let them in. And the first thing they do is pull out some money and they give you the five dollars back plus they give you ten more they tell you what happened yesterday they say i'm sorry please forgive me i saw the five dollars i needed it and then by me taking your five dollars i got blessed and now i'm returning the five dollars plus i'm going to give you ten more that on the surface that would seem like a good thing wouldn't it they stole five dollars from you and now they're not only giving you your five dollars back, but they're also giving you ten dollars as compensation for uh, you missing the five dollars. But what is what is not being understood by some people is that even though you got your five dollars back on Tuesday, which was stolen from you Monday, and in addition to that five dollars, you got an additional ten dollars compensation. Even though all of that happened on a Tuesday, it does not erase the fact that you were a victim of theft by a friend on Monday. Amen? It does not erase the fact that it was stolen. This is what I'm trying to tell you. And this is why you ought to give no thought to it. Now I'm going to tell you what the average person is going to do from that day forward. When that friend knocks on the door, they're going to have all their things. Especially black folks. They're going to hide everything. Why? Because once burned, twice burned. Amen. Most people do that. You're a little skeptical about letting them in because you know that they stole from you the last time they were there. But see, when you woke up that Tuesday morning, it was a new day. Even if they did not come back and give you the $5 that they had stolen and the $10 compensation for the theft, even if they didn't come back, you ought to forgive them and move on. 
Do you think Paul and Silas were bitter at the jail? You know, you, when the jailer came up to him and said, what must I do to be saved? You know, they could have behaved differently. Hey, wait a minute, you just locked us up? You was planning on doing some real nasty stuff to us the next day because when they took him out of prison, they was gonna probably gonna beat him and flog him. That's what they were probably gonna do. Well, that's the only what happened. And they could have they could have responded in a number of ways. They could have been like some people nowadays. Well, I mean, you know, uh, you did that to me, uh, you did that to me, you said that about me, you said that about me, you did this to me. So I am not gonna have anything to do with you. But see, daylight came. It became a new day. And when it became a new day, you ought to rejoice. Because first of all, God blessed you to see a new day. So don't take that day by carrying negative feelings into the next day. I've often said, every day is a new day to me. I don't care what you said to me yesterday. I don't care what you did to me yesterday. I'm going to say good morning. Now, if you bring it back up, that's a different story. Then we'll deal with that till 1159. Amen? We'll deal with that till 1159. But then, trust me on this, man, 1201, it's a new day. Your daylight is coming. And that's why God wanted you to know in this scripture that at midnight, it was a new day. And the blessings came after midnight. Amen? You have to look towards the new day. You know, right now, somebody's probably planning a two-week vacation. Right now. Somebody's probably looking towards the new day. Right now. There is nothing wrong with planning. But don't be consumed in it. Because the word says, you know, thought for tomorrow. It'll take care of itself. There are some people who actually worry about next Thursday. Actually worried about next Thursday. Next Thursday hasn't even got here. For all you know, you might not be here next Thursday, so why worry about it? There are people who stand around, sit around and worry about stuff, worry about stuff. I've often advised folks, don't worry about them. So it's part of the Don't worry about nothing you can't do nothing about. Amen? She probably won't like it. But one year, she had an issue with Edison. <laughs> and she, she was all nervous. Oh, Edison, Edison, oh, oh, oh. It was Edison back then. Oh, Edison, oh, they're going to do this, they're going to do that. They put this thing on my box and I can't use my hair dryer or something. I think it was around 9 o'clock at night. I said, what time did they come back? Oh, they came back and said, what they done for the night? So don't worry about it. Don't worry. And I told them there, don't worry about nothing that you can't do nothing about. Even if I had gave her $500, she wouldn't have been ready to go pay that bill. Amen? Early the next morning, because it was a new day, I went over to Highland Park and I took care of it. Amen? You know what I tell folks nowadays? I mean, and I tell them, I, I told people this. They told me, well, Reverend, you know, I, I was up last night worried about this, worried about that. And you know what I tell them? I tell them the same thing I'm about telling you. Don't worry about it. Because the Word of God says that God never sleeps. Amen? Amen. God never sleeps. Yeah. No sense of both of you being up. Right. So you might as well go to sleep. Because I've told you before that when you are at rest, God goes to work. And when you are working, God takes a rest. When God sees you trying to do this and do that and do this and do that, instead of standing back or taking a seat and resting and let him take care of it, he's just going to rest. Amen? He's going to stand back and take a rest. You have to trust him in the dark. I'm sure that it was dark in that prison because the scripture says at midnight 
Everybody know at midnight it's dark. And they probably didn't have no lamps and lights and things in that prison. So when the sun went down, it was probably dark in that prison. And even though it was probably dark in there, they still trusted in God. I know this because they were still upbeat. They were still inspired. The scripture says at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. So they were whispering back and forth to themselves. They were shouting it out. Amen. And they trusted God in that darkness. You have to trust him in the dark. Because we all know this. The unknown resides in the darkness. You ever try walking through your house with no lights on? I do it all the time. I walk through a house with no lights on. Can't see nothing. The other day, I came in the house, and we have a light switch right there by the front door. I could have turned it on just as easily and saw my way. But no, no, I'm going to try it in the dark. And the next thing I know, bam! I hit my forehead. I hit my, I, I, I hit my forehead on the collar of the doorway. I was about six inches off. <laughs> and I ran right into it. Bam! All I had to do was bring the light into my life and I would have been able to clearly see my way. You see, that's what Jesus is. Jesus is the light of the world. And if I had had that light on, I would have been able to see my way clearly and not be harmed. But I tried to walk in the dark. Now, if I had made two steps without hitting that wall, there was an automatic light that would have came on that would have illuminated my path all the way halfway to the bedroom. And then another light comes on to illuminate your path all the way to the bedroom. But there I was trying to do it in the dark. Amen. Most of you in your lives, you are way past midnight right now. Whatever it is that's going on in your life, even though there's still the dark, there's still darkness there, whatever that situation is, it's still there, daylight is coming. And that's what you have to put all your hopes and beliefs on, that daylight is coming. Another word for thinking that way is faith. I think I talked about faith the last time I was up here. I talked about faith, faith being the, the substance of things hopeful and the evidence of things not seen. Faith is believing even though there are no signs. You think that Paul and Silas were believing to be let out of that prison? You think that was what they were thinking in the back of their mind? Well, eventually we're going to get out of here. That's what faith is. Faith is believing that you are going to be healed even though there's no evidence in your body of the healing taking place. But you still have to behave, rejoice, and believe as if it has already taken place. Anybody got a nail in here? Anybody got, got a medical problem in here right now? Something. What if I came over to you and touched you and that problem went away? Would you rejoice and say, thank you, Jesus? Yes, you would. Well, that's the way God wants you to be right now. Giving him all the praises, all the thanks, all the honor due him, even though that there is no evidence that it has happened. Y'all remember the Bill Island Bridge? Remember that tunnel? I know some of you in here remember that tunnel. Pastor working out for me, you probably don't know about it. But are you from here? You remember the Bell Island Tunnel? We used to go under that tunnel? Sister, sister. Sister Crawford, though, at Bell Island, there used to be a tunnel on one side of Jefferson. And you go under that tunnel. 
And even no matter how dark it was, I mean how light it was outside, when you went down into that tunnel to get across Jefferson, it became dark. <laughs> it got dark. I mean, it wasn't pitch black, but it was darker than the surface. And you know what we used to do? We used to yell and scream, roll down the windows, yell and scream. And we did that for a reason. So that we wouldn't be afraid. Because I, the first time I think my father took us down there, you know, the windows was all up, and then as soon as the light went away, boom, and it got dark. And at night, it really it got pitch black at night. And we were actually afraid, you know, but we were cool. So it's like that. But see, when you started to come up out of that tunnel and you can see the light, then you started to feel better. That's the way it is in your life. You, when, when, at midnight, it becomes a new day. And as the day goes forward, as the day progresses, it gets lighter and lighter and lighter. And then it's morning. Some of you can even get an indication that morning is coming, that daylight is coming. What do you hear? Sometimes you hear the birds singing. Amen? And then you'll know it's not long before daylight. There might be darkness in your health, darkness in your life, darkness in your marriage, darkness with your children, your finances. There might even be darkness with your job. But know this, daylight is coming. All you have to do is stay in faith, not give in to the darkness, not fear, but know that God is going to bring you out with daylight. Because daylight is coming. The scripture, the scripture says in Psalm, weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Amen. Amen. I have cried many a night. I've cried myself to sleep many a night over the years. But then the next morning, my eyes were open, I saw the light, and I felt good. Until I thought about what I was crying about the night before. I don't do that no more. Uh, years ago, I said, good morning. It is a good morning. It's a new day. Whatever happened yesterday, I'm not concerned with. And that's, not to, that's not to say I haven't forgotten. I'm just not concerned with it. And as I get older, I forget what happened yesterday. <laughs> it used to be I just didn't concern myself with it. But it, as I get older, you know what? I done told you all about my memory. Y'all done heard about my memory. I, I done forgot about it. So that's a good thing too. Amen. No sense carrying Monday's trash into Tuesday, right? Stop at the door. Romans says the night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day. There are a lot of things that people do in the dark that they would not do in the daytime. Amen? Amen. I read to you, you read a scripture, you heard a scripture this morning that says, men love darkness. Yeah. And it went on to explain to you why men love darkness. And God's word is not a lie. If God says it, that settles it. Men love darkness because their deeds are evil. That's the word of God. And God does not lie. His word does not lie. So if he says men love darkness, they love darkness because their deeds are evil. But I'm here to tell you, you need to get the light into your life. And that darkness will go away. Ephesians said, you were formerly darkness, but you haven't been in darkness since Jesus came on the scene, because Jesus was the light, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children, that's in Ephesians, walk as children of light. And I, you know what? It's not an overnight thing. 
I told you about faith. Faith is not an overnight thing. Faith is not a one-time shot. Walking in the light is not a one-time shot. It has to become a lifestyle. That's why the word says, no greater show of love than a man that will lay down his life for a friend. Jesus said, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. Are you willing to lay down your life for Jesus? I asked the question, and I think I've asked you before, how many of you would die for Jesus? Lord, he raised all the hands. It wasn't a big congregation, but most of the people raised their hand. And then I said, how many of you would live for Jesus? It's easier to die for Jesus than it is to live for Jesus. Because when you die, that's it. Oh, but when you live for Jesus, it becomes a lifestyle. It becomes a daily task that you stay out of the darkness and remain in the light. Job was in darkness, wasn't he? Everything was taken from him. He lived in darkness for how many chapters? 40 chapters? Seemed like a lifetime to him, probably. But you know the interesting thing about Job's problem? His problem was only nine months. I mean, if you ever read, how many of you ever read Job? It seemed like he was going through that for years. It was only nine months. <laughs> how long does it take to birth a baby? Nine months. He got a new life in nine months. He stayed with the light. He stayed faith because he knew his daylight was coming. And not only did God bring him out with his daylight, he gave him double of what he had lost. He ended up having how many more? Ten more kids. So how many children did he have total? Twenty. That's double what he had, wasn't he? Okay. When Joseph was thrown into the pit by his brothers, it had to be dark in that pit. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they had no lamps down there. They throw them candles down there for it. But you see, Jay, Joseph was sitting down there. He probably wasn't cussing his brothers out, let me out this so and so. Probably just sat there patiently and waited. And his day might came. Because the scripture tells me, along came to Ishmaelites. And then he was sold to the Ishmaelites. And can I stop here for a minute? Can I stop here for a Who are the Ishmaelites' descendants of? Ishmael. Right? The Ishmaelites that came along in Joseph's time were descendants of Ishmael, who was put out in the wilderness by his own daddy at the word of God. And his descendants, you could say, rescued Joseph from the pit and took him to Egypt, where again he was placed, he was placed in a prison. And then he was released and became the second to the Pharaoh in all of Egypt. You see, God doesn't waste anything. Just because Ishmael was cast out into the wilderness does not mean that his life was wasted because generations down the line, his descendants were instrumental in Joseph making it to Egypt. Amen. Because the Israelites never would have got to Egypt to be imprisoned if Joseph hadn't went there first. Because you recall, and we didn't, I don't want to steal the pastor's thunder because he covered up on this. Hey, Joseph went back and got his family, all of them brought them to Egypt. And then the scripture said they multiplied. Amen. You might be tempted to force daylight. How many of you have sat there? I know I did as a child on Christmas Eve. Come on, daylight. Come on, daylight. Come on, daylight. I wanted to force daylight. Just like Abraham and Sarah tried to force daylight, God told them, you're going to have a child. And when it didn't happen in two weeks or two months or two years or ten years, they tried for 15 years have gone by and they still haven't had a child. They tried to force it by having 
Hagar delivered Abraham's seed. His child. They tried to force that daylight. Just like that Christmas Eve, I tried to force that daylight. I knew what was going on in the kitchen, and then I got up out of bed, and I went running through the kitchen, and I saw toys that my mom and daddy were putting together. I went into the bathroom, and there I am in the bathroom. I got a chance to see what was coming at daylight. But see, sometimes God don't want you to force daylight. And there's going to be a penalty for you forcing daylight. Because when I came out of the bathroom, I went to run back to my bedroom, and I heard, I heard this, <coughs> I heard this swish, this sound of something going, and then I felt this pain on my bottom side. It was my mother with that strap. Get to me. See, I paid for trying to force daylight. If I had just laid in that bed and patiently waited for God to bring the daylight, I'd have been all right. You cannot force that daylight. Abraham and Sarah had to wait 19 years for their daylight. Your daylight, it may not come in a few hours. Your daylight may not come in a few days. Your daylight may not come in a few months, not even in a few years. But your daylight will come. You just have to stay in faith. Ask me how I know. And I'll tell you so. Because it happened to me. I'm almost done. For 42 years, I waited for daylight to come in a specific area of my life. Because, see, 42 years ago, I did something that I wasn't supposed to do. And something happened that would happen to me what you're not supposed to do. And out of cowardice, I made a decision that, and, that, that affected the rest of my life. And I asked God for an answer. Now God gave me the an answer right then and there, but he did not. And every time the situation came up, I asked God the question. Nothing. And I continued over the years to ask God the same question over and over. But then three weeks ago, I was watching TV and I saw this show that had the same subject of the question that I've been asking God for 42 years. And then I went to sleep. And in my dream, I got my answer. I know some of you probably sit out there with me. 42 years ago, I was involved in something that I swore I'd never be involved in again, abortion. And it was because of my cowardice that it was done. And then when I found out just the entire situation, you see, it wasn't just one child that was aborted, it was two. They were twins. But I continued to wait for an answer. And then three weeks ago in my dream, their mother came up to me in my dream and said, these are your daughters. My beautiful daughters. My prayers were answered. My daylight came 42 years ago. I am no longer in the unknown anymore. I'm in the realm of the known. And I was happy. I was pleased. That one conscious thought changed my life. Last point. Be careful what you promise God. Be careful what you promise God, especially when you are in the twilight. Because God may put you to the test. And I promised God that night that I would never have anything to do with that ever again in my life. And over the next 10 years, he tested me three times. That number three. 
three again. He tested me three times. And I've passed all three times. Amen. Because I said I'll never have anything to do with that. And I will not have anything to do with the person who does that as, as it pertains to me. And God tested me. The first time, I said, don't do it. And they did it. And I dropped them like a bad hat. The second time, I said, don't do it. And they did it. And I dropped them like a bad habit again. Bob, oh, we'll see that third time. Hallelujah. Yeah, I didn't even have to say don't do it. <laughs> I didn't even have to say it. When the social worker showed up, I gave their, and how many black guys you know you do? <laughs> I gave that social worker my name, address, home phone number, work phone number, I gave my salary, I gave my social security number, I gave it that ego. Because see, for me, it wasn't about the money. It was about the promise that I made to God. I promised God. And God rewarded me. Oh, he rewarded me for keeping my promise. That's why I call her my promise. Y'all remember, I call her my promise, baby. And look what she did. She grew up, gave me four beautiful grandchildren. And I am so pleased. You see, my daylight came in that situation too. Likewise, your daylight's gone. You have to just stick to the faith. Keep your promises. Stay encouraged. Wesley. Your daylight's coming. Okay. Sister Thomas, your daylight's coming. Sister Parker, your daylight's coming. Brody, your daylight's coming. Craig, your daylight's coming. Sister Velma, your daylight's coming. You just have to be like Paul and Silas. Stay in faith. God bless you. God keep you. Amen.